Welcome to our third lecture relating to Chapter 3 of our uh, textbook. Um, we will be starting on slide 38, but let's go back to the beginning. We are working on Chapter 3, which covers ethics and professional responsibility. The first lecture we got through slide 16, and then um, for our first, um, for our second lecture, we did the first four canons of um, the Nala canons. We did things paralegals must not do. And now we're up to slide 38. And we are now going to do the, the positive things, the things that a paralegal must do. We're up to canon number five. Okay, a paralegal must disclose his or her status as a legal assistant. And I'm gonna add or paralegal. Remember that NALA is the National Association of Legal Assistants, so they're much more likely to say legal assistant than other entities, but what they mean here is paralegal. So a paralegal must disclose his or her status as a legal assistant at the outset of any professional relationship with a client, attorney, or a court, or administrative agency, or personnel thereof, or a member of the general public. A paralegal must act prudently in determining the extent to which a client may be assisted without the presence of an attorney. The first part is easy. You just have to tell people you're a paralegal. The second part is trickier. When do you need to bring the attorney in? When is when are you uh, not qualified to render the assistance that is being requested? That's more challenging. Okay, so let's first of all address that first issue about the degree of disclosure. Let's see how these work in terms of disclosure levels. Paralegal gives his business card to a potential client. The card says John Smith, CLA, legal professional. Well, um, those of us in the legal business would know that CLA stands for Certified Legal Assistant. And so we would know that John is not a licensed attorney. But most people in the general public have no idea what CLA stands for, and they may genuinely think that John is a, an attorney. So this would not be adequate disclosure. Paralegal introduces herself as Gwen, Bob Smith's right arm. Bob is the attorney. Again, this is not adequate because, for one thing, uh, Gwen is not attached to Bob. <laughs> she is her own person. Um, and also, uh, even if you accept the metaphor that uh, so there, someone can be under the person's right arm, um, uh, Gwen could be a junior attorney who is functioning as Bob's chief assistant. So this is not adequate disclosure. Paralegal signs a letter. Doug Chin, paralegal to Bob Smith. Okay, this is great. Yes. Um, she would, he, excuse me, Doug wouldn't even have to include the, para, the paralegal to Bob, whatever I said, to Bob Smith. Um, that's not necessary, but certainly it's fine to have it in there. Anyway, so this is good. Paralegal calls opposing counsel and says, this is Pat Green from the office of Brown and Juarez. This is not adequate unless, of course, uh, the paralegal routinely calls opposing counsel, so opposing counsel is well aware who Pat Green is. Um, but if opposing counsel isn't, the assumption would be that Pat Green is an attorney. So what she should have said, or he should have said, is a paralegal from the Office of Brown and Green. Then it's okay. But that's not what he or she said, so we're going to say no on this one. Okay, we're up to canon number six. A paralegal must strive to maintain integrity and a high degree of competency through education and training with respect to professional responsibility, local rules and practice, and through continuing education in substantive areas to better assist the legal profession in fulfilling its duty to provide legal service. So we're talking about a competency here which can involve additional training. And this is a, obviously another, a big issue for the, uh, the attorneys as well, and we address this issue through Rule 101 about competent and diligent representation. Let's go back to that rule. Here we go. So we're going to go to the very beginning, the very first rule. After the preamble. And here we go. 
A lawyer shall not accept or continue employment in a matter which the lawyer knows or should know is beyond the lawyer's competency unless another attorney who is competent to handle the matter is, with a pri um, the prior um, informed consent of the client associated in the matter, or the advice or assistance of the attorney is reasonably required in an emergency, and the lawyer limits the advice and assistance to that which is reasonably necessary under the circumstances. Now, you may think, well, well gee whiz, uh, certainly the attorney is, is qualified to represent anybody. After all, they're members of the bar, they pass the test. That's absolutely true that the test is in d designed to be a general test. Um, but it would be a little bit like going to your um, obstetrician and saying, I need brain surgery, please do that. Well, the obstetrician would be more qualified to do brain surgery than... I would be, um, but still would be likely very uncomfortable with performing the surgery and would not see himself or herself as really qualified to do that. The same thing exists in the law. For example, I practice labor and employment law, and I've talked to many attorneys who don't practice in the area, and many times they have very little understanding about what the law is. Could they learn the area of the law? Absolutely. Um, it's not beyond their abilities. They just haven't. Similarly, I feel woefully inadequate to discuss topics such as intellectual property and tax law and criminal law. Um, most attorneys, especially attorneys in larger cities, specialize, and so we become really, really deep experts in a pretty narrow topic. Um, uh, there are attorneys who are generalists who have a broad understanding that is obviously somewhat more shallow. Um, and they represent in many areas. That's a perfectly fine way of practicing, kind of like a general practitioner or that primary care physician is. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but in those situations, most um, solo practitioners who have a, a general practice are going to refer their attorney or their clients to a specialist if the issue becomes especially complex. So yes, we're all eligible, all attorneys are eligible to practice law and there's no um, rule that says, ah, oh, you've got to have this particular credential before you can practice in this particular area. But uh, the fact remains that um, uh, that there is the understanding that you ought to have more experience. Let me give you an example of how that might play out. Imagine that I just graduated from law school in the last uh, year. I've passed the bar and I've had a practice and I've decided I'm interested in criminal law. I've done some uh, speeding ticket cases and I've done a couple of DWIs where there were no injuries. Um, I get contacted by the mom of somebody who has been charged with capital murder. The mom knows me from the garden club that we're both members of. She wants me to represent her son or her daughter in this case. Well, um, I don't have nearly enough experience to represent somebody in that circumstance. And so I would be uh, being, uh, I, I would be incompetent to do that. I could not do a good job. Now, I could associate with somebody or work along with another person who has represented people in capital cases or at least has had six, this extensive experience working in uh, uh, serious felony cases. Before, uh, the two of us could work together to represent the son or daughter who's been charged with a capital offense. But me on my own, that would be inappropriate. Now, we did talk about the issue of emergencies. Uh, many attorneys will have um, that call that sometimes happens. Usually it's 2 or 3 in the morning. They'll have a family member or friend who's calling and saying, hey, I was just arrested for DWI or whatever the thing might be. Uh, what do I do? Well, under those circumstances, um, attorneys oftentimes will say, have kind of some set piece of advice. Don't talk to anybody other than giving your name. Um, and um, I will, uh, you know, get you an attorney or I will come down there and, and be with you or whatever. Um, but the, the, as soon as possible, as soon as you can find a criminal attorney to represent that person, you ought to disentangle yourself from it. And your advice in those circumstances ought to be just don't talk to anybody. Don't talk to anybody. Um, you know, just to keep the status quo, to maintain the status quo as long as possible. Um, another aspect we're now on, on rule number two is that an attorney has to follow a client's decisions. Um, I, I guess a, a surprise that for me when I began practicing was how often I disliked my client <laughs> um, and how often my clients seemed to kind of dislike me. 
Um, looking back, I'm kind of surprised by my naivete and not realizing that would happen fairly commonly. Um, and if you talk to attorneys and paralegals who are practicing, they uh, will almost universally tell you that that's a pretty common thing that happens. Um, some of this familiarity, breeding, and contempt, but part of it is there's inherent tensions in the relationship. Um, the attorney has a lot of information, but the attorney is fairly dispassionate about it. Uh, he or she isn't going to be deeply affected by whatever the decision that is made. The client doesn't have as much information, but is very, very deeply concerned and involved in that issue. And so um, uh, there's all kinds of emotions and perspectives and different ways of looking at facts. And so uh, many times an attorney wishes he could just say to his client, just do what I say. What you want to do is stupid and wrong and bad. Um, but at the end of the day, unless it's unethical, the client gets to make the decision. The client whose claim is at best worth $10,000, but somehow or another is offered $20,000 but refuses to accept it, is entitled not to accept it, even though it's really, really deeply stupid. And even though it's going to cost the attorney a lot of money, because let's say the attorney had a contingency fee arrangement. So the attorney was expecting to get 25% of whatever the client got. And the attorney's thinking, 25% of, of $20,000, gosh, that's, um, that's $5,000. Boy, this case was a stinker. $5,000 is amazing. But no, the client said no. And now, but the attorney's thinking, we're probably not going to get any money. We're probably not, the jury's not going to believe our story. We're going to get zero amount of money. I'm going to have to keep on working on this loser case. That's a bummer. <laughs> That's a big bummer. And it's a completely realistic thing that can happen. And other than trying to persuade the client, um, cajole, persuade, talk, you know, all that kind of stuff, it's ultimately the client's decisions. So the attorney has to abide by the client's decision with respect to the objectives and general methods of representation, with respect to settlement, with respect to the plea, if it's a criminal case. And of course, a plea is, is when you say whether you're, guilty, you're saying you're guilty or not guilty. Now, there are limitations. Um, generally speaking, a lawyer must abide by the client's decisions, but there's an exception when the client wants to engage in criminal or fraudulent behavior. When the client wants to do that, the attorney cannot assist the client in doing that. Um, uh, now, of course, sometimes a client wants to expand the scope of a law. Let's say the law currently is X, but the, the client thinks, well, gee whiz, I think the, the law ought to be X and Y, or just Y. As long as the attorney is representing the law as it currently exists accurately to the court, it's okay for the attorney to suggest an expansion of the law. But the attorney cannot um, um, uh, help commit a fraud on the court or fraud on anybody else or any kind of criminal behavior. Now, of course, once the criminal behavior is completed, then the attorney can represent the client. But let's say the client comes to you and says, I'm thinking about killing my husband. Um, I need some advice about how to go about doing it in a way that I won't get caught or I won't go to prison. That would not be lawful for the attorney to assist the client in that way and in fact the attorney would have to actually go if, if the attorney believed that that the husband was in genuine peril would have to go to the police and inform on this person that was potentially his client um when a when a, this goes to the next one when an attorney when a lawyer has confidential information clearly establishing the client is likely to commit a, a criminal or fraudulent act that is likely to result in substantial injury to the financial interest or property of another the lawyer shall promptly make reasonable efforts under the circumstances to dissuade the client from committing the crime or activity And also when a lawyer has confidential information clearly establishing that the lawyer's client has committed a criminal or fraudulent act in commission of the client's services have been used, the lawyer shall make reasonable efforts under these circumstances to persuade the client to make corrective action. Sometimes though the client won't be willing to make the corrective action. Sometimes the attorney has to go to the authorities. Now in those circumstances, again, it's a very fact-specific situation um, and it's, it's something appropriate for the attorney to do. But let the attorney know if you become aware of something along those lines. And a, a lawyer shall 
keep a client reasonably informed about the status of the matter and promptly comply with reasonable requests for information. You may recall when we looked at the Texas Bar Journal and we looked at various um, circumstances in which um, attorneys were disciplined, one of the things we saw in many of the descriptions was that the attorney failed to reasonably keep his client informed. Keeping the client informed on a reasonable basis is a responsibility that attorneys have. It is a responsibility that the attorney often delegates to the paralegal to be that information conduit. Of course, ultimately the attorney is responsible for making sure it happens, but the paralegal often actually implements that piece of activity. Now, when we looked at the uh, disciplinary actions for the, for the attorneys, sometimes the attorney has failed to keep the client reasonably informed because the attorney was um, busy with other matters or perhaps the attorney was experiencing drug or alcohol issues. But honestly, sometimes the reason why the attorney did not keep the client reasonably informed was because the attorney was in some way defrauding or cheating the client. So sometimes the, the, the lapse is a little bit more innocent, sometimes it's a little bit less innocent. One of the reasons why um, uh, it's very common for attorneys to, to bill clients on a monthly basis, and the bill, in addition to being a record of what what the amount of money that is owed by the client. It's also a summary of what the attorney and the paralegals have done in that particular uh, matter. And so that can act as a, that can satisfy this reasonable request for information as well. So let's look at two situations to see if a paralegal is competent. And again, these are a little hokey. I apologize in advance. So a paralegal has been working as a paralegal for 20 years in family law. Recently, the Texas legislature has made substantial revisions to the statute. Paralegal has attended several CLEs to learn about these changes. Okay, so yes, she's done the right things. She is competent. That is a good scenario. Paralegal decides to leave family law to work in litigation. Actually, litigation is, a, or paralegal is a type of litigation practice. So we're gonna say this is civil litigation. Since there is a litigation component to family law, she feels that she is already well prepared. Is she competent to be a, a litigator? Um, yes, she is, uh, yes. She is competent to switch practice areas. That is a pretty common thing to do. More common for paralegals to do, honestly, than attorneys. Attorneys are loath to switch practice areas once they are well established because um, it, you know, it's a lot of work to develop that knowledge base. Her problem, though, isn't so much that she's not competent to make the switch, but she, she's suffering from some hubris. hubris. She thinks she's already prepared when she does have a learning curve. So I would say no. She needs to be open to how much she needs to learn. There's going to be different terminologies, different rules, and if she assumes everything's the same, um, then she's not acting in a competent way. So again, I wouldn't ask this particular question. What I'm trying to get at is no, with her current mental attitude about not needing to do any prep work, she's not really prepared even though she could be if she were to approach it from a different perspective. Let's look at Canon 7. A paralegal must protect the confidences of a client and must not violate any rule or statute now in effect or hereafter enacted, controlling the doctrine of privileged communications between the client and attorney. Attorney-client privilege is a very big issue, very, very important, and being able to keep secrets of your client is a huge responsibility for all legal professionals, including the paralegal, certainly. Um, I'll give you a, a little pointer. One thing one doesn't want to be in a job interview when you are seeking a position as a paralegal or even as a legal secretary receptionist is you don't want to be, this is an old-fashioned term, but I'm just going to use it, a chatty Kathy. You don't want to be the person who is so blah, 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 um, that it looks like you're going to engage in gossip and you're just don't, you can't turn off your mouth. You don't want to be that person in a job interview because even though you may not have re revealed any confidences, if you leave the impression that you just have diarrhea of the mouth, it, that could really be a warning sign for, for not uh, being someone that the law firm can trust with its secrets. 
Here is the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct. We're now up to Rule 105, uh, Confidentiality of Information. Now, not all information that a client shares is privileged. Um, let's imagine that you have a client, we'll say the client is Bob. Bob comes into your um, uh, office and um, where your office is, you don't have any windows. And he says he, uh, he's, uh, uh, he's got an umbrella in his hand and he shakes it a few times and there's little drops of water that, that, that roll off. And he goes, boy, it's raining cats and dogs outside. And you go, oh, really? I didn't know that. And then you go on and have your practice. Or you, you talk about whatever he's there for. Let's say he's um, wanting to write up his will and you're assisting him with that. Well, the fact that it's raining is not a privileged communication. Um, it's not privileged for a lot of reasons. It probably doesn't have anything to do with his representation. Uh, for another thing, it's generally available information. All you had to do to find out it was raining would be to, you know, go to a door or to a window and see that it's raining. Um, and in that situation, obviously, that's not the type of information you couldn't share with other people. Bob isn't expecting you to keep the fact that it's raining privileged or confidential. But let's, let me give another example. Let's say that Bob were to say in the conversation, we're discussing as will, that, um, um, his wife was just diagnosed with cancer. Um, that might be important information for the will, for how you're going to structure things. Let's say Bob wants to leave his um, assets exclusively to his will, but he also recognizes that his, his wife may not uh, be alive at the time of Bob's death or may not live long after he lives, so he wants to make sure that there's a plan B in the event that that, that happens, as you'd, you'd ordinarily have a plan B anyway, but it's especially important under these circumstances. Um, is the fact that his wife has has cancer is that um, privileged information possibly but possibly not um, it's not necessary really for the representation that you're having here um, although you could argue it is but let's assume that it's not still does Bob want you let's say it's a small town does Bob want you talking all around town about oh poor Sally she's dying of cancer how very sad no, he told you that because you needed to know that or you would benefit from knowing that in order to provide him with assistance. And so even if it isn't covered by a privilege, if it's confidential information, if the client doesn't want it shared, you shouldn't share it. Part of that's just good business sense. When you're rep helping a client or anyone who's paying your fees and they don't want you to do something and you don't have to do it, it's probably a good idea not to do that. Imagine that you're a hairstylist and you have a regular customer. She comes in and she talks about all kinds of things. She talks about her grandchildren and how some of them are getting into trouble at school and doing this and doing that. She talks about her children. Some of them are unemployed. A couple of them have uh, uh, drug or alcohol problems. She discusses her husband. He's um, uh, uh, has uh, some some personality characteristics she doesn't care for. Anyway, she just kind of lets her hair down, literally and figuratively, and tells you all kinds of stuff. Um, but imagine if, if, if you were to then uh, start sharing this generally in the community. Probably she's not going to continue to frequent your salon, and she may actually tell her friends not to frequent the salon because you, she can't, uh, you can't be trusted. Now, there is no stylist client privilege out there in the law. There is absolutely no legal right that she has to expect that you'll keep her confidences. But you can see how it would be poor business for you to share that information with others. Okay, so let's talk about um, when information can be shared. A lawyer shall not knowingly reveal confidential information to anyone other than the client um, but if the client has agreed to, for you to reveal that information to somebody else, then you can. This is fairly commonly done. Let's say that the, the, um, as part of the representation of the client, um, you, you have decided with the client's approval to hire an expert witness. Let's say it's a car accident case and the expert witness is going to evaluate, um, 
uh, how quickly a car could break on under certain driving conditions, a certain model of a car. So you, maybe it's a it's a, some type of engineer who's going to do this. And well, obviously the engineer is going to have to get a lot of information about the car and about your client and all this kind of stuff to figure it out. Um, and so under those circumstances, the client likely would give you consent to share that information with the expert witness. That's perfectly appropriate to do under those circumstances. Certainly, the the attorney can share information with the client, with people that the client has has named as kind of in his circle of people. This might be employees or family members, and also anyone who works in a law firm who has a business need to know. If it's a small law firm, that really could be anybody. If it were a really large law firm, then you ought to have a kind of a smaller grasp of that. Um, you sh an attorney shouldn't use information to the disadvantage of the client. Um, you know, you ought to be used for the advantage of the client. Now, sometimes it might make sense to share information that's disadvantageous to the client because the attorney knows that that information will ultimately be revealed, say, through the discovery process. And so by sharing the information now, you might be able to explain it or diffuse the issue or perhaps build uh, a more trust relationship with opposing counsel. So there could be times where it makes sense to reveal that information, but you ought to get the agreement of the client before you do that. Of course, in all these cases, you ought to talk with the attorney before you, you reveal this information. Let's talk about some situations where you can reveal the information. Again, um, when the client has agreed, When the attorney thinks it is necessary to do so in order to comply with a disciplinary rule or a court order or some other law, for example, if it were, say, criminal behavior. When there is a controversy between the lawyer and the client and that information is necessary for the lawyer's defense. And when the lawyer has reason to believe it is necessary in order to prevent the attorney from committing a criminal or fraudulent act. Again, the client who comes in and says, how do I kill my husband? And to the extent uh, revela re re revelation reasonably appears necessary to rectify the consequences of a client's criminal or fraudulent act in the commission of which the lawyer's services had been used. Again, these are very fact-intensive issues you ought to be talking with the attorney um, to see really what is required you should not be you as a paralegal should not be reaching these conclusions on your own but this gives you some idea of the categories that might be in play okay when a lawyer has confidential information clearly establishing that a client is likely to commit a crime or fraudulent act that will result in the death or substantial bodily harm of a person, the lawyer shall reveal confidential information to the extent re revelation is reasonably appears necessary to prevent the client from committing a criminal or fraudulent act. So again, it's when it's when there's a, uh, that thre threat of uh, death or serious bodily harm. So again, the person who comes in and threatens to kill his spouse, that would be a case where you'd have to contact 911 or similar resource. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about confidentiality. A re a violations of confidentiality include conversations overheard by others. So imagine that you're meeting with your client, uh, or let, let's say it's you, you've, you've, you're taking a break from trial and you and the attorney are at the local diner having uh, a meal and you're discussing strategy. But guess what? There's other people who can overhear the conversation. Well, guess what? You may have waived the attorney-client privilege with respect to that. Also, using cell phones or computers in public places. Let's say you are uh, traveling to go to a hearing and you are doing some work on the airplane. You're in the middle seat, and so people on either side of you can see what's on your computer screen. Again, you are not respecting the confidentiality of your client. Um, If you breach that confidentiality intentionally or unintentionally, it oftentimes will destroy sometimes the whole privilege. 
Um, sometimes just what you, whatever it is that you uh, revealed. And keep in mind these two situations, especially when it's inadvertent, the client had not, did not give permission for this revelation. So you can see how it could be very damaging to the client. And if the client is damaged that way, you can imagine how angry the client will be. The client may well file a disciplinary action against your attorney or file a malpractice case against both you and the attorney if you're responsible for the disclosure. Okay, so we're going to talk through a fact pattern here. Um, we're going to start, um, the, the paralegal in the scenario will be you. Um, somebody, uh, a long-standing client of the law firm comes in. We're going to call him Reverend Bob. This is a small town that you live in. You and Reverend Bob live there and several other people, but it's not a big town. Anyway, he's the prominent minister in town. Everybody knows him. He um, has the largest church in town. Anyway, he comes to see you, and he confesses to you that he is having um, an affair. He's a married man. Um, and uh, he uh, needs to get some legal advice because of this affair that he's having. And it's an ongoing affair. He doesn't intend to end the affair. And he's having the affair with Lisa, who is also a married oh, person. Well, you don't attend Reverend Bob's church, but your best friend, we'll say your best friend is um, Bill. Bill attends this church. And you know what? Bill is a single parent. He doesn't make a lot of money. Um, he donates generously to this church. He's there often. He uh, brings his children. This is where his children go to Sunday school and receive religious instruction. And uh, you know that Bill has a very high moral sense and that he would be appalled and shocked to hear that Reverend Bob is having an affair that's ongoing and that Bill would immediately withdraw from this church and would not want his children exposed to that kind of environment. Um, so uh, ethically, you feel like you, you've, you ought to disclose this to Bill. Um, you, you actually feel that you have an ethical obligation to alert the friend, his friend Bill so that Bill doesn't waste any more of his money. Can you tell Bill? No, you can't. Because you would be revealing the confidence of scumbag Reverend Bob. You don't have any respect for Reverend Bob. It doesn't matter that you don't have any respect for Reverend Bob because Reverend Bob is your client. Lots of times you won't have respect for your clients, sadly, but that's the, the case. So let's change the story up a little bit. Reverend Bob is not your client. Oh, oh well, let's do this one first. Okay. Um, Reverend Bob isn't your client. Reverend Bob is Lisa's husband. We'll say Lisa's. So this is Reverend Bob's. Um, uh, so Lisa's husband is Pete. So Pete contacts your law firm. He comes in. He's also a longstanding client. And he says, Sandy tells you, my wife, Lisa, is having an affair with Reverend Bob. And I need some legal advice about that. And he presents, you know, maybe you're initially skeptical because after all, Reverend Bob is this upstanding minister. But he presents evidence that is, you know, un undisputable. It's videotape. It's letters. It's all kinds of stuff. It's clear that, in fact, Reverend Bob and Lisa are having an affair and that it is ongoing. Um, so now you're thinking, well, I saw this friend Bill. He's still going to that church and he would be appalled to know this. Surely I can tell Bill now because after all, uh, Reverend Bob's not my client. Lisa's not my client. Poor Pete here is my client. Um, surely I can do that. I can tell Bob at this point. My ethical, my morals, they tell me I need to. Well, no, your, your, your morals may be that way, but your legal ethics are that you cannot reveal. Imagine Pete doesn't want um, his dirty laundry to be spread all around town. Maybe Pete and Lisa have children together, but even if they don't, Probably Pete doesn't want the intimate aspects of his marriage to be the, the fodder of gossip in the community. Of course, if Pete were to say, you know what, um, paralegal, tell everybody you know about this. I want to sink Reverend Bob's rep reputation. Then you have the permission. I would still talk to the attorney before I did that. But assuming the attorney agreed, uh, uh, you'd be okay then to do that. 
But in real world, Pete isn't going to do that. He's not going to want this spread around. Even though in this scenario, Pete did nothing wrong, it still could be embarrassing for him. So you still can't share the information with Bill. Okay, now we're going to go back to Reverend Bob. But this time, Reverend Bob has never used this law firm for advice. He's coming to see you for the first time. And he sits down and he begins the conversation by saying, I'm going to interview several different law firms in town. I don't know that I'm going to use y'all. But I want to tell you my circumstances and you can tell me kind of how y'all can help me. And so I'm going to kind of, I'm interviewing you. So, of course, under this scenario, Reverend Bob isn't a client. He's just a potential client. So uh, he, of course, Reverend Bob proceeds to tell you the story about his affair with Lisa. It's ongoing. He doesn't plan to end it. Surely under these situations, Reverend Bob isn't even a client. Now you can tell Bill. Well, now you can't. Um, the privilege extends to potential client relationships, not just current client relationships. After all, if you didn't have that rule, how would Reverend Bob ever get representation? Um, because he's not going to, uh, you know, he, he's going to have to share some information in order to figure out whether there's a good fit between the firm or not. So uh, the potential, uh, up until the point that the law firm tells Reverend Bob, we're not taking your case, anything that Reverend Bob shares is protected by attorney-client privilege. And this would also work whether it's Reverend Bob or Pete or Lisa for that matter. Same story, but instead of it being adultery, Reverend, the, the minister is stealing funds from the church. So Bill puts money in the offering plate, and it doesn't go to uh, pay the light bills of the, um, the, the church. It doesn't pay to pay, it doesn't go to paying the secretary or the youth minister. It goes into Reverend Bob's pocket, and maybe Reverend Bob is using that money to go to the Notel Motel with Lisa. Because after all, Reverend Bob's married, so he can't be using funds that his wife, Lucille, would know about. So um, we have Reverend Bob stealing money from the church. Boy, under these circumstances, surely you can tell Bill now. No, you can't, unfortunately. Um, you can't tell Bill about this. Um, so now we have the next story. We, we no longer have Bill. Bill is you. You're the single parent. You have given generously to this church, you, uh, both of your time and your finances. You have permitted and, and encouraged your children to be involved in this church. Having heard either through Pete or through Reverend Bob what's going on in the church, you're just flabbergasted and shocked and sickened to hear it. So can you... Um, go to, let's say you teach a Sunday school class or lead some other group within the church. Can you go to those folks and say, you got to know what's going on here. I mean, people in the church look up to you. They see you as a leader. They trust you. They would expect you to tell them if you knew this kind of information. No. You certainly don't have to give any more. You can withdraw from the church. But you cannot tell other folks about why you're withdrawing or what's going on in the church. Let's add another wrinkle to the situation. Let's say that Reverend Bob um, t tells you, this has been going on for several months, he tells you, you know what, um, people from the, uh, the diocese are suspicious. Uh, are, it looks like the amount of uh, donations to the church have declined even though church membership is up. They're suspicious. They want to audit the books. And if they audit the books, they're going to find out I've been stealing money. And very likely, they're going to find out about the affair, too. So I'm thinking I need to have a fire in the office where the records are kept. So I'm planning on um, uh, doing a little arson. Um, and that, that's my plan. Uh, tell me what, what I need to make sure is burned and, and how I to go about doing it so I'm not going to get caught. Well, under those circumstances, we're now talking about something that hasn't, so we'll say planned arson. It hasn't happened yet. In the, up until this point, we've been talking about behavior that isn't criminal, that no one can get physically hurt by. Um, but um, we're talking now about an activity that is inherently dangerous. People could be in the building. Um, firefight, even no one is in the building when, when Reverend Bob does it. Um, firefighters could be injured ex extinguishing the fire and so now we've crossed the line this is probably a situation in which we have to 
actively discourage Reverend Bob from uh, doing this activity. And if he refuses, we might have to um, alert the authorities. Again, talking with an uh, attorney. So in this situation, this is our first and probably our only yes. So the bottom line is whether your client is a scumbag or a saint, you got to keep their, their confidences unless it's about a future action that could involve risk to people's safety. Okay, let's talk about Canon 8. A paralegal must disclose his or, to his or her employer or a prospective employer any pre-existing clients or personal relationships that may conflict with the interests of the employer or prospective employer and its clients. This is called a conflicts check. Most law firms conflicts check. Most law firms of a significant size will have databases where anytime you accept a case, you will enter into the database the names of the clients, um, including the human beings as well as the business entities, and even maybe major witnesses in the case. And so when uh, you get that next person who wants to be a client, you'll enter that name and all the information relating to the case. You'll run it through the conflicts checks database to see if there's a conflict. Um, if there is a conflict, then you would not be able to represent um, him or her. You'd have to say, no, we can't represent you in this case. Um, another time that this comes up is when you are changing practices or, or, or not so much you know, going to work for another law firm. Um, it may be that some of the, the people that you represented in law firm A, um, the, 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 uh, the uh, law firm B, the place you're opposing, what you're applying to is opposing counsel. And so under those circumstances, you'll have confidences of the other side. And obviously you can't use those confidences for the benefit of your new law firm. And so under those situations, um, sometimes the, the, the conflicts can be so severe that you can't even uh, work for that new law firm. But most of the time, it's, it's okay for you to, for the law firm to connect, conduct, uh, excuse me, construct what's called an ethical wall around you. And this is a metaphoric wall, it's not a physical wall. In this situation, anytime that matter that, that you are conflicted out of is raised, you have to absent yourself from the room. You can't listen to what's being said. You can't contribute to anything that's being said. Um, you should not have access to the file. If you happen to walk in and they're discussing a particular matter, you should immediately leave. They should know that you sh they should not talk about it in front of you, and so they should stop the conversation. If you're in a meeting and they start talking about that case, you need to leave. If you see things on the copy machine um, that relate to that case, you should um, um, immediately alert someone and not read the documentation. Some people refer to uh, ethical wall by its old-fashioned name, which is the Chinese wall. This relates to the Great Wall of China, where, which was a, a, a barrier, a physical barrier between the Chinese Empire and other groups of individuals who might have chosen to attack uh, China. Um, but the term is not preferred because um, it could be intended or could be taken to be uh, offensive to people of um, a Chinese ancestry. So the term ethical wall is preferred. Also, it's more descriptive of what the nature of the relationship or the, the, the situation is. Here are the rules of the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct that relate to conflicts of interest. And we have rules 106 through 111. Again, you don't need to know these numbers. But these say attorneys sh should not represent a client if it would be adverse to another current client's interests. I'm just going to add current. Parties may uh, consent to simultaneous representation if there are no adverse impacts. I'm going to return to this one in just a second, so I'm going to put this in bold. Attor the attorney should not represent an adversary to a former client in a related manner. A job change may require the creation of an ethical wall. We've already talked about that. Conflicts checks are standard procedure and helps to avoid a conflict from developing. Okay, I want to talk about this in a second as well. But let me talk about the first one. Um, simultaneous representation is very common, and it's, in most cases, perfectly appropriate and perfectly ethical. Imagine for a second that a husband and wife come to see you. Uh, they jointly own their home, and they want to sue a plumber who has, uh, in their opinion, damage their house by not doing correct plumbing work, which has resulted in significant water damage. Um, 
it wouldn't make sense for the husband to hire one attorney and the wife to hire another attorney because there would just be duplication of effort. It wouldn't be cost effective. In that situation, it would be almost automatic that the husband and wife together would hire the same law firm to represent them. That would be simultaneous representation. Now, there can be times where simultaneous representation is not okay. Well, let me give you an example from my practice. Um, when I was an employment attorney, I'm change, changing the names, of course, but there was um, a case that came up. Sally was a former employee. She had been dismissed from her employment, and she wanted to sue her former employer. We'll say it was ABC Corporation and her former boss, Bob. She said that Bob uh, sexually harassed her and that um, when she refused to continue the relationship, he fired her and that she was a good worker and there was no basis for her being fired, no lawful basis for her being fired. Um, so I was hired to represent ABC Corporation and Bob. It's very, very common for plaintiffs in employment discrimination cases to sue both their employer, the, the legal entity, typically a corporation, and their immediate supervisor. So this is a very common thing. And in the majority of cases, not every case, but in the significant majority of cases, the same law firm who represents the corporation can also represent the former um, supervisor. And that's what I did. And I interviewed Bob, I interviewed um, other people who work at ABC Corporation, and they all confirmed that there was no support for Sally's claim that uh, Bob had sexually harassed her. Um, that, uh, and there was abundant evidence that Sally had been a poor worker. Uh, she had a very poor attendance record. She had a very poor productivity record when she was actually at work. And uh, when I interviewed other individuals, everyone said there was no indication of any kind of sexual banter or activity between Bob and Sally. And so this seemed like Sally was just kind of making up this whole story. So um, the case went forward and, and uh, we got to the discovery portion of the case and Sally's attorney noticed the deposition of Bob. Very common thing to do. You'd expect that to happen. So I prepared Bob for his um, deposition. We went over the likely questions that Bob would ask. He seemed poised and calm and confident. He looked like he was going to do a good job of the deposition. Well, we went to the deposition and um, Sally's attorney began the deposition by asking kind of the standard questions that start a deposition, such as, you know, state your name for the record, state your home address, give information about in your education, your employment history, all that kind of stuff. And Bob was calm, cool, and collected. He was doing a fine job. Um, then uh, Sally's attorney uh, flipped over to the subject matter, and um, Sally's attorney jumped into his, his first question after he did the general background questions was how many time um, how many times did you and Sally take showers together well I of course thought that was such a ridiculous question obviously Bob and Sally had never taken a shower together because they had never dated they had um, had just a professional relationship um, so I was flabbergasted well Bob just stared at Sally's attorney and didn't say anything and you could see Bob was sweating bullets he was clearly very addled by the question and Bob said that he couldn't answer the question I was completely astonished I was like did do you not understand what he's asking and so um, we took a break and I went outside I said Bob what are you talking about of course you never took a, uh, a shower with Sally you never dated her you never did any of those kind of stuff and Bob said, well, you know, it, it is true. I told you I never dated Sally. And we never did, you know, go out on a date. But, yeah, we, we took a lot of showers together. You're not going to have to tell my wife this, are you? So <laughs> the bottom line is that, of course, Bob was had lied to his employer and had lied to me. And so as a result, I was no longer going to represent Bob because the simultaneous representation was not going to work. There were adverse effects. Uh, Bob was going to have to find his own counsel at that point in time. ABC, though, relied upon what Bob had told him, so ABC still had all kinds of defenses available to it. Bob, not so much. So simultaneous representation is routinely done in the legal industry, but um, 
it is can be problematic, especially when um, the, the two people that are being simultaneous represent, simultaneously represented have different defenses available to them and different facts that they believe happened. Let's talk about this other item, this conflicts check. Um, it's conflicts check helps uh, avoid a conflict. By doing the check, you can see, ah, we can't really represent that person because uh, we're already representing the person that they're suing in another related matter, for example. So it's a way of avoiding a conflict. And obviously that's a goal that you have. You don't want to have a conflict. So if there's so many strategies you can use to avoid it, it's really important to use it. So here's some excerpts from the rules. I'm not going to go through these rules in great detail. I'm going to kind of flip through them because I've already kind of talked about them. Here are rules about former clients. Um, though it is important to keep in mind that your, your, the conflict of interest rules are not as strict for former clients as they are for current clients. Um, a, an attorney who, who personally has formally represented a client in a matter shall not thereafter represent another party in a matter adverse to the former client. Um, if it is the same or substantially related matter. If it's not a, the same or substantially related matter, then it is possible to represent someone who is adverse to the former client, for example. Um, let's go through these, and, and I'm not, uh, this is more of a conversation starter than anything else, but let me just kind of touch on these for a second. Um, paralegal goes to the same church as opposing party. They are not social friends. No duty to disclose this. Now I will tell you it's always better to, to disclose my, my philosophy is, of course, disclose it to the attorney. Just let the attorney know because it would be embarrassing and it might undermine your relationship with the attorney if you didn't share it. But there is no conflict. You can go to the same church or other social club with somebody and there is no conflict of interest. Paralegal used to be married to the opposing party. The divorce was amicable. Well, this you absolutely have to disclose. Um, for one thing, divorces that are amicable at one point may not be amicable when um, there's a child custody issue that may come up later on, um, or there's new revelations about the reasons for the divorce or things along those lines. And so it's always um, iffy to say that a divorce is amicable, everybody's good friends now. Um, but certainly having a marital relationship with opposing party um, is something that ought to be disclosed. Paralegal used to work directly with the opposing party at different place of employment. Uh, this could go either way. It depends upon um, what your duties were. Was this before you were a paralegal? Um, how how uh, close was the working relationship? Um, but definitely something I would disclose. And the answers would largely be the same whether it's an opposing party or opposing counsel. The bottom line is it's better to share information than not. So go ahead and share it. Let the attorney reach the decision about whether it is um, a sufficiently severe conflict that an ethical wall has to be constructed. Let's look at um, some of the remaining canons. We're looking at the third element of canon C. You may recall that canon, excuse me, the third element of canon three, you may recall that initially had the three parts. Well, this is the, the third part of that. Um, this is that a paralegal cannot engage in or take any action which would assist or involve the attorney. So this is a, um, we'll say, must not. Must not engage in any act in, in conduct or take any action which would assist or involve the, the attorney in the violation of professional ethics or give the appearance of professional impropriety. Canon 9 is a uh, paralegal must do all things incidental, necessary, or expedient for the attainment of the ethics and responsibilities as defined by statute or rule of law. And finally, Canon 10, a paralegal's conduct is guided by bar associations, codes of professional responsibility, and rules of professional conduct. So basically, you got to follow the rules about professional behavior. Okay, now we're going to touch on just a couple of rules that don't fit completely into the, the paradigm that we've been looking at but are still really important for you to know. Fees. Fees have to be reasonable. Now if you talk to most clients they will say my fees aren't reasonable, they're outrageous. But reasonable of course is a relative term. They have to be reasonable given the amount of time that the work required, given the fees that are customarily charged in that re region, given um, the amount that was subject to the matter, you know was it a suit for 
you know, ten thousand dollars or ten million dollars, and also considering the results that were obtained, also the experience of the attorney and his reputation or her representation in the legal community, and then um, of course you ought to have negotiated the um, the rate or the basis for the fee with the client, preferably in writing before the um, relationship developed. There are attorneys in the Dallas area who charge a thousand dollars an hour, not many, but a few, and those can be reasonable, even though they sound like they couldn't be reasonable. Just keep that in mind, though, that under the totality of the circumstances, were the fees reasonable under that circumstance? Okay, the next one I want to talk about is when you are representing an organization. This one is so easy to forget, even attorneys and paralegals sometimes forget this. Let me uh, talk about the example uh, when I was in-house. When I was in-house as a labor and employment attorney, uh, the, the primary individuals that I worked with were HR managers. Um, and they, we would refer to as my client because um, uh, they were the, the face of my client. Now, my, my client was a corporation. You, know, you can't speak to a corporation. This corporation can't speak back to you. It's a legal fiction. The only way that I could represent my client was to speak to its agents, its managers, its employees. And that's what I would do. Um, and so I would sit down and talk to an HR manager and listen to what he or she had to say about the circumstances and give him or her the guidance that I had. So most of the time it was perfectly fine for me to think about that manager as my client. But really, that manager really wasn't my client. My client was that legal abstraction. My client was the corporation. Because every now and again, the HR manager's interest and my client's interest would not necessarily align. For example, let's say that that HR manager comes to me and says, oh, I need to talk to you. I need to get some legal advice. I messed up. I uh, fired somebody I shouldn't have. Um, they were uh, a, uh, a, a disabled person, and I didn't really understand how uh, disability law worked, and I thought it was okay to dismiss them, but I don't think it was now, and I'm really worried about what I did. Well, of course, you want to find out all the information this person has because you want to fix the problem if there is, in fact, a problem because um, that's in your client's best interest. But on the other hand, if this HR manager really did violate the law, this HR manager may be subject to disciplinary action, including dismissal. And so um, you're in, you, the, uh, the paralegal or the attorney who works for the corporation, is in a difficult position. You need to encourage this person to become forthcoming, but this person seems to think that you are his or her personal attorney. And he or she may think, uh, foolishly, but he or she may think that what he or she tells you is going to be privileged and that you aren't going to tell it to the corporation or to maybe his boss, or the, the representation of the corporation for this purpose. But in fact, you are ethically required to disclose that information to the client because your client really isn't that HR manager. It is that entity. And so you need to make that clear when you're dealing with your clients, your human being clients who work for the corporation, that in fact they are not truly your client and that you have to share that information that you learn. And many not, it doesn't come up often, fortunately, but many times I, I have been in a situation where I've had to say, this is something I have to share. I know you prefer I not share it, but I have to. And that's the obligation, so keep that in mind. And then let's talk about uh, truthfulness and statements. In the course of representing a client, a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of material fact or law to a third person. So you can't pretend the facts are different than which, what they are. And you also cannot disclose, uh, fail to disclose a material fact to a third person when disclosure is necessary to avoid making the lawyer a party to a criminal act or knowingly assist in fraudulent act perpetrated by a client. So there are rules about how you can represent the client, how you can advocate for that client. Okay, so let's hear some bottom lines. Here's some things to keep in mind about how these rules will affect you. Watch out for the unauthorized practice of law. That's the one that might get you thrown in the pokey. Keep secrets of your clients and people related to the matter. Disclose your role as a, a, a paralegal in all written communications, including email, and also at the beginning of any kind of relationship that you have. Disclose potential conflicts to the law firm. Continue to gain expertise in your practice to maintain your competency. And the bottom line is, behave as if the bar rules did apply to you, because they essentially do.
So here's a summary. I'm going to leave these up here so you can fill in the blanks. Um, we have now concluded our um, presentation on Chapter 3, so this is our third and final lecture on this. I hope that you found value in this, and um, if you have questions, please feel free to bring them to class or bring them to my office hours. I'd be glad to assist in any way that I can. I'm going to stop my sharing, and I'm going to stop the recording at this time. Thanks for your attention. Bye-bye.